Well, welcome everybody. Does everybody have uh, your Matthew 7 from last week, if you were here last week, or if you haven't been here last week, did I get one to you already? All right. Welcome. I'm excited for tonight. I'm excited every Thursday night, really. I get. I can't wait till 6 o'clock hits. I just get kind of, ooh, all excited, all googly-eyed. Uh, we're going to be finishing Matthew 7 today, and then... Uh, I'll hand out Matthew 8 when we finish Matthew 7, and then we'll get as far as we can with Matthew 8 today and go from there. And just a reminder that everything we do with Bible studies and sermons and everything else is always online, so if somebody missed last week with the beginning of Matthew 7, that's on our YouTube channel, and you can go directly to that, or you can go through the website for us and find it that way too. Um, So that stuff's always accessible, and, and the link to the PDF is there, so you can go right through it the same way as if you're right here. And uh, same would be if you know you miss another section or one from weeks ago, uh, you wanted to catch up from everything that you missed. That's all online. So, and if you have additional questions that you know didn't come up in what you're listening to, just ask me directly. I love answering questions. So, um, I think, why don't we open in prayer before we study God's word? Lord, thank you for this time and this opportunity. It is all thanks to you. I certainly am not worthy of teaching or preaching your word. We are not worthy of your grace and your mercy that you extend to us to be able to put our faith in you, saving faith by your grace through faith in Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. We have so much to be grateful for, so much to be thankful for. We pray that you'll help us to not only learn your word, but to abide in it. And as we study together today, Lord, let us be encouraged, let us be uh, illuminated, and let us be given wisdom so that we, as we leave here, we know even more of what your will is and how to accomplish it for your glory and our good and the good of those around us. We thank you for all this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Last time we left off at question 12 in your Matthew 7 packets. I can't remember how far we got through that answer, so we'll just kind of recap that one just to be sure. And again, Matthew 7 is kind of the end of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And as we finish off here, if there's any additional questions, you can let me know when we're done. But hopefully we've caught some of the most poignant or most commonly asked questions as we go. One of those questions is question 12, which says, What do the people in verse 22 put their trust in? For salvation. And verse 22, just to remind you, says, On that day many will say to me, Jesus speaking, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? So in that verse, what are those people putting their trust in for salvation? Their works. Yeah, if you had to summarize it, you'd say their works, right? Hey, didn't we prophesy? That doesn't necessarily mean fortune-telling, right? It it means, didn't I preach? Didn't I speak forth your truth? Didn't I preach for you? Didn't I preach in your name and teach in your name? Didn't I cast out demons in your name and do many mighty works in your name? Yeah, exactly. The works. Didn't I do this? Didn't I make a profession? Didn't I say with my lips that you're Lord? Didn't I attend church regularly? Didn't I give? Do you see all the different ways that you could point to this all being works. And it's not our works that save us. Works can be an evidence of our salvation, right? And they are. That's why Jesus says, you'll be known by your fruit, which are your works. So that's what that is. So what should they put their trust in for salvation? If they're not supposed to put, if we and they are not supposed to, they're supposed to put our trust in our works, in a prayer, in profession, in church attendance, in teaching the Bible? What are you supposed to put your faith and trust in for salvation? Christ. Christ. Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ alone. We think of John 14, verse 6, right? When Jesus says, I'm one of the ways, I'm one of the truths, and I'm one... Oh, no, wait. That's not right. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. Exclusivity there. He is the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only way to get to heaven through 
Jesus Christ. So yeah, pretty clear, right? These are people who are saying Jesus is Lord, by the way. They're not saying Jesus doesn't exist or anything like that. They're professing that he's their Lord. But they've got it all wrong. They thought that Jesus was their Lord and all they had to do were these works and then that would get them into heaven. But Jesus says, away with you, you workers of lawlessness. So instead of them getting what they thought they were going to get, they thought that what their works were going to accomplish was righteousness and entrance into heaven. And instead, Jesus gives them the hard, cold wake-up call that the works you have done were not for me. They weren't for God. They were for yourselves. They were works of lawlessness or rebellion. Scary. Scary. Definitely one of those verses, one of those sections of Scripture that really cements how important it is to make sure, to examine your faith, make sure it's genuine, that you're not putting your trust in a, in a prayer you said at band camp or Bible camp 20 years ago, that you're not putting your, your faith in walking down the aisle one day or your faith in the fact that your pastor said that you're saved, so you must be saved, right? Because it's not us that save. We ask Jesus to save us. He said, Lord Jesus, will you please save me? I don't say, be my Lord. He's already my Lord, whether I accept him fully and leave him as my master or not. He's already my Lord. So I'm not trying to do something to get him to save me. I am like literally on my knees, humbly begging him, will you please save me? Only you can save me. The only way to save me is by you. You're the only one who can do it. That is a proper way to look at salvation. He's the one we should put our trust in. I might have spoiled question 13 here because I get too, too into it. Why does Jesus call the people in verse 23 workers of lawlessness? Why does he call them that? Didn't they affirm Jesus as Lord? Why does he call them workers of lawlessness? I mean, they call them Lord, Lord. Why is he calling them workers of lawlessness? Were they really working for him? No. They were working for themselves. It was, again, a rebellion. Sin, all sin is rebellion against God. Even if I say, um, well, uh, even if I put it in a Christian package, even if I have a, a Christian veneer on it, right? And I say, well, you know, I'm... I'm, I'm a believer in Christ. I'm a Christian. Look at all these things I go out and do for people. Look at all this stuff I do. Look at all the giving I do. All these things. What am I pointing to? I'm pointing to my works. And if I'm pointing to my works for the evidence, you know, like if I'm pointing to my works and saying this is why I'm saved or why I think I'll be saved, I'm, I've got the wrong idea, don't I? Because it's Christ who saves me. I always worry when people say that they're Christians and then I never hear them talk about Christ. I hear them talk about everything else under the sun, God's promises, prayer, you know, how great it is to be, you know, blessed and highly favored and all, and all this stuff. But I never hear, if you have been truly saved by Christ and you understand your sinfulness and you understand that the only salvation is Christ, then he's, he becomes your everything. And the more and more you understand your own depravity, your own sinfulness, the more you understand how much you need a Savior, and so how much more higher will you lift him up? And that will be your everything, your focus, where your treasure is, as we saw in Matthew 6. He'll be your treasure because he's, he's everything. He's the only hope you've got. Totally different when you hear people say, oh yeah, I'm a Christian, and then they go on to talk about everything else but the core of Christianity, which is Christ. Christ. So why does Jesus call the people in verse 23 workers of lawlessness? Because the works they were doing were rebellious works. To the world, they might have looked like good works, but their motives, they were doing those works for themselves. They were doing those works, uh, they were doing the wrong thing. Jesus didn't say, you want to be saved, repent and do good works. That's not what Christ said. That's not what any of his prophets have ever said. You want to be saved, you want to go to heaven and be with the Lord, repent and go do good works. That's not what's ever said. It's repent and believe. Put your faith in Jesus Christ. Big difference. Anytime we sin, we break God's law, and it makes you a rebel. Sometimes it helps to think of it sin that way, as it's rebellion against God. It's not a whoopsie-daisy. It's not a whoop. It's not a mistake or something where we're like, whoa, I really screwed that up. I need a mulligan. It's, you know, it's not something to be thought of in this playful tone 
right? It's rebellion against God. And that helps sometimes to set a more serious, appropriate tone. Any questions about that? Does that make sense? And how that ties into Jesus' warning. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord. It's a warning against what? What's Jesus warning about? When he's saying all that through for verses 21 through 23, what's he warning those who are listening and, and us who are reading it today? What's he warning us about? Many will say to me, Lord, Lord. But in the end, he'll say, I never knew you. Away from me, you workers of lawlessness. So what's he warning us about? False faith. False faith. Hypocrisy. Apostasy. Right? A falling away. A, a fake faith. Self-righteousness. Working, trying to save yourself by works. Having the wrong Jesus and the wrong gospel. He's warning us about all those things. He's warning us about sin and all that. All right, let's move on. How about verse 24? Jesus continues. He says, Everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house. But it did not fall because it had been founded on the rock. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. Question 14. Jesus, in his example here in verses 24 through 27, what do the following things represent? In his little section here, what does the house represent in those verses? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. What's the, what's the house represent? Yeah, their faith. Your life, your spiritual life, your faith. Yeah. I think the, the easiest way would be to say your spiritual life. That'd be the easiest way of saying it, covering everything. And there's two different types of houses, right? There's the spiritual life that's, that's based on the rock, and then there's a spiritual life that's based on sand. So there's two different types of spiritual lives. So that brings us to the next word, the rock. What does the rock represent? Solid foundation. Sure. And what is the solid foundation that your spiritual life should be set upon? Christ. 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 God's word, Christ. The true gospel, the true Christ, God's word. You almost have to say and, and, and make sure you say God's word rightly handled nowadays. Because if I say just God's word, you can have people who are disregarding the truth of God's word come out and tell you a million different things while they've got a, a Bible in their hand. But if it's not rightly handled, it's false. So God's word rightly handled, Christ, that's a solid foundation. That's the rock. And a rock doesn't move, right? It's a solid foundation. Well, with that known, what about the rain and the flood and wind? What does that represent? Rain, flood, wind in this, these verses. God's judgment, trials, tribulations. Ultimately, God's judgment. So when God's judgment comes, you think about it. I've, I have my spiritual life. It's so different when you read this again with different terminology, right? Let's finish and say, what's the sand? What, what's the sand represent? Anything other than the rock, right? It could be anything. Any, it could be any, because there's a million ways to hell. There's a million false gospels, but there's only one true gospel. There's a million false Christs, but only one true Christ. So there's anything other than the true Christ, the true God's word, rightly handled, the true rock, is it sand. Anything other than those things is sand. So let's read it again with that, new, with that new thinking, those new terms, right? Everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a, a wise man who built his spiritual life on the rock of God's word and the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And when judgment came, when the rain fell and the floods came and the winds blew, when judgment came and it was time for your spiritual life to be judged, it did not fail, it did not fall. Your spiritual faith did not fail or fall because it had been founded on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And everyone who hears these words of mine and does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his spiritual life 
on sand, on something other than the true gospel of Jesus Christ. And the rain fell, and the floods came. Judgment comes and beat against that house, and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Make sense? Much I'm mean, powerful, right? This is how the hearers who were listening to Jesus, that's exactly how they would have taken it. The same way that we just did it. Because I didn't have to have it explained to them like we just did. As they're hearing this, they would automatically be making these connections, right? So when we slow down and, and take our Bibles and make these connections, you get a taste of a much more powerful saying, right? This is, this is a, a warning of Christ talking about true salvation. There's only one way. You must make sure that your spiritual life is built upon the rock. Because if you don't, when the winds come and trouble comes and judgment comes, if you're not built on the rock, it's like you built your house on sand. And nobody's dumb to put their house on sand. Everybody knows you don't build your house on sand. Right? So he's making that point powerfully. Very powerfully. That only trust in Christ and his provision by God's grace saves. Any questions about that? Look, verse 28. And when Jesus finished these sayings, the crowds were astonished at his teaching. For he was teaching them as one who had authority and not as their scribes. Seems almost like throwaway verses, right? Like kind of the ones you read really quickly because you're, oh, I'm done. Oh, and you read it kind of quickly and move on. But there's something there. Who, question 15, who are the scribes? What was a scribe? What would they... What would they do? They would copy down, study the law, study the, study the Torah, right? They would copy things down. Of teaching and uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you've got, uh, they were typically part of the, of the Pharisees, not necessarily having to be, but generally associated with them. Why did the crowds think that the scribes taught without the same authority as Jesus? Why did the crowds notice and think that, wow, Jesus teaches as if he has authority? It's totally different than when the scribes tell us what God's word says. What, uh, why would they think that? One thing would be that scribes repeated what other people said, right? That's what scribes do. When... when Scribes would say something, they're depending on what other people say, and they're regurgitating it or re, re saying it, right? So the authority that they have comes from the someone that they're repeating from, right? They're repeating from someone. They're not the source of the truth that they're speaking, they're just repeating it, right? So there's a difference when you are someone who is repeating the truth and from being this person who is the truth, where the, the source of the truth originated from. What a difference. They notice that it's, well, it's completely different when man regurgitates truth from when Jesus is speaking the truth. He speaks with authority. Well, yeah, because he was and is the authority. He's the source and the or origin of all authority and all truth. So they noticed that. They noticed that. He didn't, Jesus didn't need what other people said to be worthy of being heard. But a scribe would. A scribe relied on what somebody else said and being able to use that to give them some sense of authority. But it's completely different, isn't it, than the type of authority that Christ himself had as God. Yeah, absolutely. And many times, you'll hear sometimes people say that, well, Christ never claimed to be God. He never claimed deity. But yes, he did all the time, just like what Dan just said. You know, my father, what's that saying? That he's the son of God, which would make him deity. And when he goes through in John and he says, I am, even like what we said at the beginning in John 14, verse 6, I am, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. That's hearkening back to when God said to Moses, I am that I am. He's declaring, and the reason why the Jews got so offended at him saying that and were ready to stone him is because they knew exactly what Jesus was saying. He was saying that when he said, I am, he's claiming to be God. They knew exactly. That's why they reacted so violently, because they thought, blasphemy, he's claiming to be God. So we know that, that he was very clear 
in claiming his deity all the time, all the time. When the apostles ask him, where are you going? Oh, I'm going to see the Father. Oh, well, can we see the Father? Oh, if you, you know, how long must I suffer with you? If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. Dodo burning, you know. But be gentle on him because we would do no better. <laughs> we would do no better. Any questions about what we read in Matthew 7? Okay, now that we've finished Matthew 7, we can move on to Matthew 8. Yay! Are you guys enjoying this? Do you find that this is helpful, the way that we're doing this? You go slow, you go verse by verse, and you can process. You can take time to ask questions, make sure that you're really absorbing everything that's there. It's so easy to read through quickly and really not be studying it, you know, where it's kind of, you're reading it, but you're not really digesting it. You're reading it, but you're not fully understanding it. So it's nice to slow down like this and go through things verse by verse. And we're going to do that again here in Matthew 8. We'll start in verse 1. When he came down from the mountain, this is Jesus, when he came down from the mountain, great crowds followed him. And behold, a leper came to him and knelt before him, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus stretched out his hand and touched him, saying, I will be clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus said to him, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a proof to them. Brings us to question one, what is leprosy? It's good to know, not everybody knows it. It's not something that you necessarily grow up and needing to know, so it kind of fills you in. It's a somewhat contagious disease. It was thought back in that day to be very contagious, that if you touch somebody or anything that you could be contaminated. Today, uh, science tells us that it's mostly contaminated through um, your nose, through like juices in your nose and that sort of thing. That's where it's most contagious is that way. It's not as contagious as you would think based on what history tells you, but it was viewed as a very contagious disease. It would affect the skin. It would affect your uh, membranes and nerves. Discoloration and lumps would happen. It was a very visible disease, very easy to see. Disfigurement, um, deformities, that sort of thing. So that's what leprosy is. So a man with this affliction came up to Jesus. And the second part of the question is, did that leper doubt that Jesus could make him clean? When we read that, and behold, a leper came to him, came to Jesus, knelt before Jesus, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Was what he's saying there, was he doubting that Jesus could make him clean? No. no. How do we know he wasn't doubting? Because he says, if you will. In other words, if you are willing. Lord, if you are willing. And that statement right there, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. That presupposes that this man with leprosy believes that Jesus has the power and the ability to heal him if he is willing to. So yes, the leper did believe that Jesus could make him clean. But what a, what a request, right? He didn't go up there and march up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I demand you heal me. No, he was so humble, wasn't he? If you're willing, if you're willing, you can make me clean. That shows faith, right? It also shows humility, trusting in God's will over your own. Of course that man wanted Jesus to heal him. Of course we know that's what he wanted. But how right it is for us to yield to God and let him be the one to decide if he's going to do something or not. That was a very right thing to do. Why did Jesus tell this man, question two, why did Jesus tell this man to say nothing to anyone? Was Jesus afraid that TMZ was going to you know, take the account and twist it somehow? Or why would Jesus tell this guy, look, don't go tell anybody about this? Could be that, yeah. I mean, definitely, definitely because of publicity. And there's that's part of publicity, right? Is that you know I don't want this huge surge of people coming uh, might hinder the true ministry of Christ. 
divert attention from the true message to something that's very worldly and superficial. Of course, you hear that someone's, uh, if someone said that, look, there's a guy who's, who's uh, growing limbs on the corner, right? Well, that's going to be all you hear. I got to go see this guy who's growing limbs on the corner. So that's going to be why you go to hear that. Oh, and by the way, he has the message of salvation for your spiritual eternity. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what about growing limbs, man? I need to see that. So in that same sense, right, that, that he wanted to try and control the message, so to speak. What about question three? What's the gift that Moses commanded? Huh? What is that? Mm -hmm. Yes, it is. And it's good that a pastor would know that. I'm proud of you. And, it's the, and we're going to read it because most people don't know that. Most people don't know that. It's good to show off every once in a while with our biblical knowledge. <laughs> or Google. Or Google, yeah, Dr. Google. Uh, so Leviticus 14 talks about laws for cleansing lepers. And this is the law of the leper. It is the sense of like a prescription. This isn't how to heal leprosy that you find in Leviticus 14. It's more about the ceremonial cleansing which was needed to be performed after that person had been cleansed. So if God had, had healed that person, this is, the, this is what they were supposed to do after that happened. This isn't how to get clean. This is what they would do if they were miraculously healed and were cleaned. Okay, so this is Leviticus 14. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, this shall be the law of the leprous person for the day of his cleansing. He shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out of the camp, and the priest shall look. The idea there was that the leper was not allowed to go back into society until they had been kind of observed, right? Checked by someone who was in the know, who was learned, to be able to see if they still showed any signs of leprosy or not. So until they were cleared by that priest who was sort of a specialist, they wouldn't be allowed back into regular society because they wanted to make sure that this person was truly clean. Then that would, once that was assured, then the priest would help assist with this ritual of cleansing. Goes on to say, then if the leprous disease is healed in the leprous person, the priest shall command them to take for him who is to be cleansed two live clean birds and cedar wood and scarlet yarn and hyssop. And the priest shall command them to kill one of the birds in an earthenware vessel over fresh water. And he shall take the live bird with the cedar wood and the scarlet yarn and the hyssop and dip them in the live bird in the blood of the bird that was killed over the fresh water. And he shall sprinkle it seven times on him who is to be cleansed of the leprous disease. And he shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird go into the open field. So this is what Jesus is, is talking to him about. This is why he says that. The bundle of cedar and hyssop. Hyssop was the thing that was used to spread the blood over the doorposts uh, in, before the Israelites left Egypt so that the Spirit of the Lord would pass over. Yeah, and it was also, hyssop was also the branch that was used to hold up uh, the sponge to Jesus. So hyssop has some history in the Word of God. But it was all uh, dipped seven times in the blood and then with the killed bird mixed to, with water to symbolize purification. Blood and water. The bird was then set free to symbolize the leper's release from being quarantined. Neat to kind of know that background because now it makes a little bit more sense why Jesus would say that to him, doesn't it? That's the gift that Moses commanded him to do. And that's what Jesus is commanding this man to do. Hey, go do this. Go do what's said in Leviticus 14. And that's why Jesus says that, because it represented cleansing. It represented cleansing. To be healed from leprosy was a miracle. It was a miracle. The priest that did that ritual wasn't healing the leper. That wasn't healing the leper. The priest observed the leper. The leper would say, hey, I've been miraculously healed. Then the priest would come out of the town to the leper's camp and observe and say, yes, you actually have been miraculously healed. And then they perform that ritual. So to be healed from leprosy was a miracle. Back in Leviticus, the priest would have been able to see that, right? And so Jesus is doing this as well. Go and show the priest. This is a miracle of God. And it would have shown that Jesus was God. Because before, a priest who went out to the, to the camp of the lepers would know that the only way this man could be healed is if God himself healed him, 
right? So here's this man who's going to repeat exactly what would have been done all the way from Leviticus 14 up to Jesus' time. He's going to go and repeat. He's going to go to the priest and say, look, I've been miraculously healed. And the priest would look at him and say, yes, you have. And they perform the ritual. But this time, instead of God the Father up in heaven, unseen, but being present healing, this time it was Jesus Christ, his son, able to be seen doing the healing. See, so Jesus is showing that he is God. He's a son of God by doing this very thing. And that's why he mentions that. Make sense? Powerful, right? Cool. The Bible's so cool. So cool. What about question four? This is always a good question I like hearing the answers to. What are the purposes of Jesus' healings and miracles? What are the purposes? We know that, you know, I'm not just talking necessarily, I always am interested in context. So, of course, right here in Matthew 8, what's the purpose of him doing here miracles and healings? But I would also be interested in knowing what you think his reason for doing healings and miracles throughout all of his earthly ministry. Why, why does he do that? What's the point? When he does a healing, is he, is he just going around trying to eliminate all illness? Is he trying to eliminate all poverty? Is he trying to eliminate all disease? I'm sorry, I said it. That he's, a, he's showing that he's a merciful God. Sure, sure. Shows that God's merciful, right? If you attribute Jesus to something to having some kind of connection to God, right? You'd have to assume that first. So that would... Yeah, it's, it's, it's proving his deity. It's also... Uh, and you can think of it as like having an authorization, right? Or giving an authenticity test to his divinity, to the fact, like, nobody can do these things unless God is with them. And so that's where the faith comes in. Like, it, it's, it, nobody can do this unless God is with him. And no one can do some of these things like healing a leper unless they are God, right? Or unless they're speaking for God, like a prophet of old. Nobody could do these things. So it's, you know, definitely as authentication of his divine nature. It's also to share the gospel, call miracle, like signs to display his power, to call people that look, something's different going on here, something, something unique. But as Emily said, you know, and, and, and JB did too, faith and, and mercy, yeah, it was to show that as well. Here's Jesus Christ, who you can't get any more faith than Christ had, obviously. And he's also showing mercy. But the point I like to always make here is that Remember that in Jesus' earthly ministry, there were many people who were afflicted with disease. There were many people who were ill, many people who were blind, many people who were deaf, many people who were dumb. Did Jesus heal every single one of them? All of them? Well, no. There were still blind people. There were still deaf people. There were still ill and sick people. Jesus did heal a great many, a great many. But that was more than that. He, didn't, he, he only cured the ones that the Father told him to. That's who he cured. So Jesus' healing was not just for his authentication. It was definitely for his mercy to be shown, to display the divine power of Christ and attest that he was the Son of God, that he spoke for God, and that God was pleased with him because God, through him, was doing these miracles. <coughs> but it's also important to note that he didn't heal everybody. And this ties into something that I want to share. It's from Luke 4. This is Luke 4. This is verses 18 through 30. And this is Jesus in the synagogue. He's reading Isaiah 61. He's in the synagogue. He's reading this. And he says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of the sight to the blind to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And he rolled up the scroll and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed upon him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Jesus was saying what Isaiah wrote in chapter 61 was talking about him. Jesus was like, that's me. It was fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. 
And they said, is this not Joseph's son? And he said to them, obviously he knows what they're thinking. He knows their hearts. This is God. So he says to them, doubtless, you will definitely, you will definitely quote to me this proverb, physician, heal yourself. When, when was Jesus told, hey, you, if you're God, then take yourself down off that cross. If you're God, heal yourself. If you're who you say you are, right? So Jesus is saying this. He's also saying, what we have heard you did at Capernaum, you do, in your, you do here in your hometown as well. And he said, truly, I say to you, no prophet is acceptable in his hometown. But in truth, I tell you. Oh, I lost my spot. In truth, I tell you, there were many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, and a great famine came over all the land. And Elijah was sent to none of them, but only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon, to a woman who was a widow. Do you see that point right there? Many people are sick. Many people were starving. But Elijah only went to one person, the one that God the Father told him to go to. So keep that pinned in your mind. And there were many lepers in Israel in the time of the prophet Elisha, and none of them were cleansed, but only Naaman, the Syrian. When they heard these things, all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. Interesting. To our ears, to our Western ears, we hear that and we're like, what did he say? Why are they getting so mad? Right? That's weird. Filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove him out of town and brought him to the brow of the hill on which their town was built so they could throw him down the cliff. But passing through their midst, he went away. That, that is saying, miraculously, he was able to escape. He's God, of course. He wasn't, it wasn't time for him to die. So how interesting is that? What are you being seen? This is, first, this is Luke's first mention of hostile opposition to Christ's ministry. And it's the first time that Christ is talking about unconditional election, that doctrine, where God himself sovereignly decides who he will save and who he will heal and not heal, when he will heal them and when he will not. It's God's sovereign election. That is exactly the kind of reaction that sinful man has to the gall of God doing what he sovereignly wants. How dare you? How, dare, how could you dare to say that? Right? That's why they were so mad. Plus, they're mad because they're thinking, wait a minute, you're talking about doing these things for the Gentiles, extending this to the Gentiles. How dare you? How dare you? This is promises for only Abraham's children. They didn't understand. So they're mad from that standpoint as well. Interesting, though, isn't it? Interesting. And that's exactly the same thing with Jesus' healing, and it kind of gets us back to the original question, right? That does, is everybody do healing? Is everybody going, you know, does Christ heal everybody? Is that the reason why he was here? To heal everybody and, and, and solve all worldly problems? Is that why he was here for the physical? To, to meet the needs, the felt needs, or the, or the physical needs of people? Is that why he came, and is that why he did the healings and the miracles? No. No, it was to show God's power, to show his, that he was authorized by God, to prove his authenticity. Because when he's doing stuff like that, you will listen to what he has to say. And when he says, I speak for God, and this is the only way to be saved, repent and believe in me for the forgiveness of your sins. Ah, okay, he's, he's got the mojo to prove he should be listened to, to prove that he does speak for God. It was always spiritual. Not, he wasn't concerned so much with the physical, although God is concerned that he's a merciful God who does care about our physical needs. But that wasn't why Christ was here. He was here for the spiritual needs. And that was what they expected, right? When everybody read about the Messiah, like in Isaiah or in any of the Old Testament, they expected a conquering king. That's what they expected. They, they expected what the world would expect, right? But God doesn't operate in the same way that the world does. So they're expecting a conquering king to come in and free them from the grips of Rome and Roman oppression and to, to fulfill all the promises of the Old Testament. But they were looking at all the promises of the Old Testament through a worldly lens, which always makes you look at things physically. And Jesus, throughout his whole ministry, is always striving to get people to think spiritually. Right? It's just like when people say, oh, Isaiah 53, verse 5, uh, you know, by his stripes we're healed. And they say, many people today 
We have many followers. Listen to people who say that means that you're guaranteed physical healing because of what Christ did on the cross, that by his stripes you are healed. And they'll say that means physical healing, that that's guaranteed for you by what Christ did. But that is not what it's talking about. And the way we know that is because of context. When you read all of Isaiah 53, it's very clear that he's speaking spiritually, that by his stripes you are healed, not physically, but spiritually, which makes so much more sense. Uh, 1 Peter 2, verse 24 says, He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. Then he quotes Isaiah 53, 5. Right after that, by his wounds you have been healed. So there's your proof in case somebody goes, well, I just don't know. Well, okay, 1 Peter 2, 24 then. Right? Because sometimes they'll pull that out of context and just read the last half and say 1 Peter 2, 24 says, by his wounds you have been healed. You just need more faith and then you'll be able to get out of that wheelchair that you've been in since birth. You just need more faith. Well, no, that's not what the scripture's saying. It's talking spiritually. Not only in Isaiah 53, but also in 1 Peter 2, 24. If you read the whole thing, it's really hard to twist it out of context. But if you chop it up in little bits, yeah, you can play with that and make it say almost anything you want. Does that make sense about what we're talking about for, for Jesus' healings and, and all that? Is everyone guaranteed to be healed this side of heaven? No. On, on the other side of heaven... Are all believers guaranteed to be healed? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So don't let people take you and tell you that because you're interested in context and proof, proving what the scripture really says, rightly handling it, that you don't have any faith in God's power to heal. No, you have great faith in God's power to heal. You're counting on it when you get to heaven, that that's when he'll fulfill all those promises. And if he so wishes to fulfill something here on earth, he certainly will and he certainly can. But you're not promised that. You're only promised it in heaven. Big difference. Big difference. All right. There's no questions about that. Let's go to verse 5. When he, Jesus, had entered Capernaum, a centurion came forward to him, appealing to him. Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said to him, I will come and heal him. That was Jesus' response right away. Verse 8, but the centurion replied, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority. There's that word authority again. With soldiers under me, and I say to one, go, and he goes. And to another, come, and he comes. And to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he marveled and said to those who followed him, Truly, I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at a table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown, of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And the centurion to the centurion, Jesus said, Go, let it be done for you as you have believed. And the servant was healed at that very moment. Awesome story. This one's very familiar to most people. Brings us to question five. Maybe you've never asked yourself this. What is a centurion? What is that? Is that a Jewish uh, soldier? What is it? Roman soldier. Not only is he a Roman soldier, he's in charge of Roman soldiers. Can you guess what a centurion, how many people he was in charge of. Think of the word century. A hundred. Yep. Yep. In charge of a hundred men. Sometimes more, but generally a hundred. What humility. What a sense of unworthiness. Right? What faith. What's different about this man from the others Jesus has accounted so far? He says it himself. He has authority, yep. So that's true. We haven't run into anybody else who's had authority in the story so far. It's faith. faith, yeah. I mean, of note, Jesus makes special note of it. That's no small thing. I mean, how good would you feel if you were standing there and Jesus said that about you? You'd be like on cloud nine, right? <laughs> Did you guys hear that? You know? 
Jesus, can you say that again? I need to FaceTime this to my cousin. He doesn't believe anything I tell him, right? He hasn't found such great faith with anyone in Israel. Even some of Jesus' own followers did not see his teaching clearly, see things so clearly as this man did. Who allowed him to see that? Was that centurion just a super-duper smart guy? Like if Jeopardy, if there was a Roman Jeopardy, would he have done really well? Was he just really smart? Is that why he figured out what these other followers of Christ couldn't? You know, why, how was he able to figure that out? Was that of his own doing? No. Anytime someone's illuminated, has their eyes and their minds open to what spiritual truth there is, it's always a gift from, guess who? God. Always. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that the things of the Spirit, the things of God, are spiritually discerned. And someone who is a natural person, who, who has not been indwelt with the Holy Spirit, and someone who the Lord doesn't help to see, can't see. They can't hear. So when truth is revealed, you know that it was done so by God. It's like when Jesus asks his apostles, who am I? Who do the people say I am? Oh, some say that you're Elijah. Who do you say I am? Well, you're the son of God. Oh, and what's Jesus' response? Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for it was not flesh that revealed this to you, but the Father. Because that same premise applies, that the only reason he was able to say those words and come to that conclusion and figure it out is because God allowed him to. God opened his eyes and his heart, regenerated him, gave him that information. Pretty powerful stuff. What faith? What about question six? What's the meaning of what the centurion says in verses six through nine? Lord, my servant is lying paralyzed at home, suffering terribly. And he said, I will come and heal him. But the centurion replied, Lord, I'm not worthy to have you come under my roof, but only say the word and my servant will be healed. For I too am a man under authority with soldiers under me. And I say to one, go, and he goes, and another, come, and he comes, and my servant, do this, and he does it. When he says, I too am under authority, he's saying that Jesus is under authority, isn't he? Well, wait a minute. Jesus is the Son of God. Who could he possibly under, be under authority to? The God the Father. And even though Jesus Christ and God the Father and God the Holy Spirit are all co-equal, they're all co-deity, they're all God, equal, they have different ordained roles. Sounds kind of like marriage, doesn't it? Uh, you're both equal. Husband and wife, you're equal. But God has given different ordained roles, which includes submission. Right? Doesn't mean you're lesser. Doesn't mean you're worth less. Jesus certainly isn't worth less than the Father, but he submitted because it was God's ordained role. It's the same with marriage. Funny how everything kind of has a little bunny trail, doesn't it? <laughs> Bless you. So what is he saying in verses 6 through 9 when he says, I'm not worthy of you to come under my roof? Why is he saying that? What, what's, what's all these things that the centurion is saying? What, but why would he say that? What do we learn from this? What's something about his faith? He, he obviously had enough faith in Christ that he believed Christ could do what? Yeah, he didn't have to go. He could be anywhere and just be like, be healed. And the guy would be healed. That's pretty great faith, isn't it? But there's a reason, too, why this centurion would say, you don't need to come. Not only is it humility, not only is it a sense of unworthiness, but because of the faith, but there was another reason, too. There was a Jewish tradition that if you allowed a Gentile into your house, that your house would be unclean. And so he didn't want to make, he thinks the reverse could be true as well. He doesn't want to make Jesus unclean. Right? So he's saying, look, I don't want to make you unclean. You're unworthy. I don't want you to be, un I don't want to be ceremonially making you unclean. I'm unworthy anyway. And you don't even have to do any of that. You're so powerful that you could heal anybody just by saying a word. Wow. Now do you see why Jesus was like, whoa, blown away. Wow. Very cool. That's the kind of faith and that's the kind of healing and power that God has. God doesn't mess around. When you see these faith healers who are on stage and they go, come up here, what's wrong with you? I've got a sprained ankle. Oh, you have a sprained ankle. Holy Lord, please heal this man's sprained ankle. How does it feel? Oh, I can feel it's about 25% better. Lord, heal it, heal it. Oh, yeah, how's it feel now? Oh, about, it's about 50% better. Oh, okay, great. Well, you just keep praying and God will 
finish that healing sometime in the future. Right? Is that how God heals? No. He's powerful. Look at the centurion. God, if you want to heal, you, you can speak a word. Right? Or look at the leper. If you're willing, you can make me clean. He knew. He didn't say, if you're willing, I know you can say something, and within two to four weeks, I will experience the full healing based on how much faith I have. You know, no, he never said anything like that. It's so different. It's so fake. Right? The reality is, is that God is all-powerful, and Christ was showing that. Every time he was healed, it was just another showing of God's power and his authority and that he was who he said that he was. So how is what the centurion says evidence of his faith? That finishes up the question seven. What, what was he saying that showed that he had faith? He, he believed that Jesus could just say it with a word. Yeah. He also believed that Jesus could do it in the first place. He didn't go up and say, um, you know, is, is it possible for you to do stuff like healing sick people? And if it is, side question, can you do that? And do you have to be present to do it? You see what I mean? There was not even those kind of little doubts where you're kind of trusting, but there's a little bit. Of, there wasn't even that. It was just pure on full faith that Jesus was who he said he was, could do anything that he wanted to do. Let's, uh, let's try and get one more. What about uh, question 8? What do verses 11 through 12 mean? And why does Jesus say this now? He says, I tell you, this is right after his conversation with the centurion. He says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness in that place where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. W why... Why does Jesus say this now? And what, is, what does that mean? Well, let's just take verse 11. What does verse 11 mean? When he says, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and the kingdom of heaven. Who's he talking about? It's the, the clue to who he's talking about is the context. Was the centurion a Jew? No. He was a Roman, which would make him, if you're not a Jew, you're a Gentile. So this makes him a Gentile. And so... Now think of this. Jesus just got done having this conversation with a Gentile who he commends for having great faith. And right after that conversation in context, in verse 11, he says to everyone around, I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. Who are the people who will come from east and west and many who will recline at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? Who? The Gentiles. Jesus is saying that there will be many Gentiles like this centurion who will be in heaven reclining at the table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's what he's saying there. Now it makes sense as to why he would say that here and now, doesn't it? Because it fits in so perfectly. Because he just got done talking to a Gentile who showed great faith. Great faith. Yeah, yeah. When, when, when God makes that promise, little does Abraham know that God's speaking about, I will save people from every tribe, nation, and tongue. I'm not going to save everybody. I'm going to save everybody. There's going to be some representation of every tribe, tongue, and nation. And when he says, I'm going to save the sons of Abraham, he's not talking about the physical seed of Abraham like the Israelites thought. He was talking about faith. Again, spiritual, not physical. Spiritual, not physical. What about verse 11? Who's he talking about there? Those who will be thrown out into the outer darkness. They'll, they'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. The Jews that thought they had an in because of it. Exactly. The opposite, right? Jesus just commends a Gentile who has real faith. And then he says, people like this. There will be many of people like this who will come from east and west that will be in the kingdom of heaven. And then he gives the other opposite example. There'll be many of you Jews who think you're going to get in, but you're not getting in. You'll be cast out of the kingdom because you don't have faith. You don't have true saving faith. That weeping and gnashing of teeth, that's eternal agony in hell. When, when you go to hell, it is not destruction. You are not eliminated. Your soul is eternal. God made it eternal. So it will either be an eternity in heaven or eternity in hell. And with weeping and gnashing of teeth, that shows 
cognizant awareness. Weeping, oh, I should have done, I, should, I knew I should have, right? Weeping or gnashing of teeth, how dare you, God? Gnash, gritting your teeth, right? That will be happening for all eternity for these people who are in hell. It's not, sometimes people, I think, take hell lightly because they think, well, it's either going to be a party filled with a bunch of other people who are going to hell, so I'll share the misery, well, at least we'll party every day, which is wrong. Or they think that, well, I'll go to hell and that stinks, but I'll just be destroyed and, and, and thrown out of existence. I'll never, I won't be. No, you will be. You will be. Any questions about any of that? All right. Let's see. Yeah, let's do, let's do question nine. That's a good way to end it. We'll end after this. Is faith always needed for physical healing to happen? You always have to have faith. There's yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. What about for spiritual healing? Do you have to have faith for that? Yeah. But who gives you the faith? <laughs> right? I mean, it's, it's kind of one of those things, you know, who's responsible for your spiritual life? <laughs> oh, I am. Oh, you are? Yeah. So you get the glory for all the good stuff you do. Well, no, God is, oh, okay. And so, so God's responsible for it. Yeah, God's responsible for my spiritual life. Oh, okay, so he's responsible for your sinning? Well, no, I didn't say that. Right. It's both. It's both, right? Like, do you have to have faith in order to have spiritual healing? Well, yeah. In order to be saved, that's how you're spiritually healed, is to be saved. In order to be saved, yeah, you have to have faith in Jesus Christ alone, right? By God's grace alone. But... And so that's one half of it. So the answer is, yes, I do. But then the other answer is, but I can only have that when God gives it to me. So both things are true. I could say, do I need faith for spiritual healing? I could say no in a sense and say, I don't need it because God's going to give it to me. And in that case, I do need it. And then you can get your mind and tied up into a knot. But the point is to show you that, that both are true, right? Does God hate sinners? Or does he only love them? He loves them, but the Bible also tells us in Psalm 711 that he is angry and hates the sinner all day long. So he hates sinners, but at the same time, he loves sinners. Both are true. And so those are things that I want to kind of open up to you every once in a while and just have you, that helps you to understand that, that both are true. Is God just and wrathful? Well, yeah. But is he also merciful and gracious and loving? Well, yeah. He's both, right? It's, it's both. Who wrote the book of Romans? Well, Paul did. Oh, he did? He was the one who inspired all that? Well, no, I mean, it was the Holy Spirit who breathed out all of text, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 7. Oh, okay. But did the Holy Spirit just lift up a pen and it just kind of floated in the air and wrote out everything? Well, no, Paul wrote it. Oh, okay, so you're telling me it's both. See, it's both. But yeah, is faith always needed for physical healing to happen? No, many times in the scriptures we saw that Jesus healed without them having faith. Right? Plus, we know how many times he chastised his apostles. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. Oh, ye of little faith. How much longer must I be here with you of little faith? All the time. Right? So, it's both. Any questions about what we've talked about so far? It's always glorifying. You're on the right track. If you use the litmus test of, does this glorify God or does this glorify man? Does this give God all the credit or does it give man some of the credit or all the credit? If it always gives God the glory, if it always gives God the credit, and as long as it's lined up with the rest of Scripture, you're on the right track. You're on the right track. But if I say to myself, well, I was, I was blessed with physical healing because of the greatness and the depth of my faith. Oh, something's wrong there. Something's wrong there because I'm spiritually dead according to Scripture. So if I'm saying that I did this all through the depth of my faith and God rewarded me, it's no longer grace because grace is unmerited favor. So you got to be careful when you say that kind of stuff. There's, there's meaning to that. When somebody says that I was healed because of the faith that I have. Well, yeah, but I don't know what you're saying there. Are you saying that you were healed because of the works that you did? In the same way with your salvation, can you be saved by the works that you do? No. Say by faith alone, through grace alone, Christ alone. All right, off my soapbox. Yeah, brave men who are standing up for the truth. 
Uh, the Nashville Statement was a statement that was crafted here in the U.S. Uh, that, uh, that many conservative and reformed um, preachers, pastors, and uh, theologians signed um, that basically affirms um, that marriage is between a man and a woman, that, that gender identity is literally only male or female, um, and such things as that. Um, you can look up the Nashville Statement, just Google Nashville Statement. You can read through, I think it's 14 different articles. They're very short, um, and you can see what, what is stated. And there's also a list of signatories. Um, I know I myself, are on, I'm on there, and many other leaders are on there. Um, I'm nothing special, but you can see who signed it and see who affirms these biblical truths. And recently, the Dutch have, have gone after these people that Dan's talking about that stood up and signed this, and they had their prosecutors look at it, uh, the national prosecutors look at it, to see if this was breaking the law in some, some way, shape, or form by being... Uh, anti or being discriminatory or being uh, hate speech, uh, that sort of thing. And so that's what they're going to be being prosecuted by or on uh, if this goes through the court system, which it looks like it might. In other words, if you were to stand up in, in uh, if you were Dutch and you were to stand up at your pulpit and you were to just preach the word of God as it is written and explain it rightly handling it about homosexuality, gender, um, anything, like that, not going off on a rant, just exegeting the text, pulling out what the text says, interpreting it, and, and blurting it to you guys, that would be considered hate speech. That would be considered a violation. That would be considered um, a breaking of the law. That how dare you say that? And that's that discrimination angle is what has been being used here in the U.S. as well. It just hasn't garnered a lot of attention because it happens a lot, but it happens in small stages and the, the news don't usually put that out, but it's happening here and now too. And that might be the angle at which they try and uh, you know, shut the churches, shutter churches from saying the truth. So it'll be interesting to see what happens there. But typically it seems like what happens over in Europe trickles into the US. Uh, the same stuff happens just at a different rate. It's very quick. Slope is very steep over there. Things are, children that are being, um, uh, taken away from their parents because parents want to teach them Christian values. Children get, are being taken away. That's already happening there. Scotland has that happening as well. Um, so, yeah, yeah. California has a several different things going on. Um, most of those things are tying funding to uh, colleges or seminaries or Christian colleges of any kind. That if you don't follow through with the rules, that if you're whether it's your faith or not is irrelevant. If it goes against the typical cultural norms of the day, you're going to lose your funding. And so, um, or that it would be considered hate speech, just like what we're seeing happening in other countries. So that's the kind of stuff that's really happening. But don't allow that stuff to, we, we stand for the truth, we fight for the faith, and we stand for the truth, but never in fear, because we have a sovereign God, and he's in control. It's the same if you've been frustrated with going to different churches and it feels like, man, I cannot find, it doesn't seem like there's very many faithful men preaching the word of God anymore. Don't be alarmed because it's God's church. He's building it. He will protect it. He will raise up the perfect amount of godly men. He will raise up the right amount of, of godly men and women for each church. He knows what he's doing. You don't have to be like the world and be gnawing your teeth raw at night. You know, he's in control, but we do... On our end, we are faithful to, to do what we have to do, fulfilling our good works that he proportioned out for us beforehand, Ephesians 2.10. Any other thoughts or questions? We'll definitely pray for them. Okay. Well, let's close in prayer. Father, your word is life, more valuable than bread and more satisfying than cold water. It is how we know you and how we know what you want from us and what to do and what is right and what is wrong, what is true and what is false. Your word speaks to us, not because of anything that we do, but because of what you are doing in us. I thank you, Lord, that you have opened the eyes and the hearts and the minds of the people who are here tonight and the people who will be listening to this message. I thank you for that. It, and I ask that you will just continue to pour out 
your knowledge and your wisdom into them. And that through that, you'll bless them and you'll give them courage and the ability to not only know your truth, but to be able to, to speak it and share it and stand for it. Lord, we have brothers and sisters all over the world who we've never met before, whose language we don't understand, but are being, their faith is being tested. They're being persecuted. They're being denied certain rights. They're being hurt. They're suffering. We pray for them tonight, asking that you will meet their every need perfectly in your perfect way and in your perfect time, that you'll give them long-suffering and patience and strength, spiritual strength, unlike what the world even knows exists, that your mighty hand will be upon them all, guiding them and helping them through your Holy Spirit to, to have their actions and their words and their thoughts be glorifying to you and be your truth proclaimed to the world, that you'll help them. And we pray that, that you'll help with everyone, not just what's happening in, in the Netherlands, but within every country. In China, our brothers and sisters being oppressed and, and jailed in other places around the world, killed for their faith. This is a blessing to, to be able to suffer and die for the cause of Christ. Jesus tells us at the beginning of a Sermon on the Mount that that is to be blessed. So we ask that you help us to live well, you help us to die well, if that's what you require of us. And we can do that with full confidence and assurance, knowing that you're in control. And whatever we suffer here on this earth, it pales in comparison to what awaits us in the life to come. Help equip us so that we might serve you better. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I encourage you guys to do the men's and women's group if you haven't done it already. And a uh, reminder about Sunday night Calvinism. Now get out. <laughs> Just kidding. I've always wanted to say that. Now get out. You know, that would be. But then there's always, there's, I always worry that somebody might be listening. Or they don't know me well enough. Like, <laughs> Perhaps. Yeah. Which, that's actually...